popular song, and we have to like turn it into an like, organic video. <coughs> All right, so let's start. So today we're doing speciation. We're doing it again on Monday as well, in more depth. Uh, anyone know, know what these are? Cichlids. Nope. Good guess, because most most cool fish in biology are cichlids, but not not in this case. Sticklebacks, right? Um, and there's a male stickleback with in, bre in breeding colors and various females. And sticklebacks are important for studies of speciation. We'll get to, get to why later in the, later in the, the lecture today. All right. So remember, what we're talking about. You know, here we have no speciation, just a bunch of individuals and running through time. No speciation, we have a bunch of individuals and a bunch of and at some point something happens and they go from two different species. Okay? And usually it's not a single point, usually it's a slow process. Um, but there are some speciation mechanisms that can do it instantaneously. <coughs> and so what I'm going to learn today is sort of how speciation gets, initi gets initialized, how it starts, and what maintains current species. Okay? Um, you know, we talked about cichlids and how they're now interbreeding because of the water becoming less clear and so they can't tell each other apart as well. Right? So, you know, it seems like it would be adaptive to be able to mate with anything if you're, you know, have no other mates, right? So, what keeps things separate? Okay? So, adaptive is some sort of drift process. We'll talk about that. All right. So, Pre-zygotic, post-zygotic. What does that mean? Yeah. It's like the sort of barriers for something to do with barriers. Right, so I'm talking about pre-zygotic and post-zygotic barriers. Right? What does zygotic mean? What's, what's zygote? Uh, egg and sperm going together. Right, so egg and sperm fuse, that's a zygote. Right? And so there's, we, so we typically separate speciation barriers based on those that happened before that process and those that happened after that process. Okay. What are possible ones? What are possible barriers? Yeah. Sterility. Sterility. How, what, kind of, what kind of barrier is that? Postzygotic. Postzygotic. Okay. So we produce an offspring, and it grows up, and it's healthy, but it can't have offspring of itself. That sounds right. Good. What else? What else could be barriers? Yeah. Uh, uh, unsuccessful fusion from sperm and egg. Um, because of species. Right. So... Sperm's there, the egg's there, and somehow they don't combine, right? Because um, fertilizing an egg is actually hard. It requires multiple sperm to sort of dig through this gelatinous coat and stuff like that, and that just might, might not work. Good. What else? Yeah? Like, um, genitalia, like ducks, like the actual mechanical, like, sort of, like. Yeah. So we're not going to talk about ducks today, but it's kind of amazing to look at, to, if you should look at it. So ducks have this really strange um, system. So a lot of birds have no intermittent sex organs, right? But ducks do. And so there's this evolutionary process where female ducks are evolving um, receptacle that's spiraled one way, and males, penis has evolved to spiral the opposite way. And so there's just this constant arms race. And so males will, you know, have a very, very large male or organ to, you know, fertilize with this weird structure. So look it up. It's, it's a very weird co-evolutionary race sort of story. You know, so, do you want to say something? Or? Uh, I was going to say another thing. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, like, self-incompatibility. Okay, what's, what's self-incompatibility? Um, so, when you all do, it's like, this whole, like, the recipient. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, right, so an organisms that have both male and female organs, right, like some plants do, right? Um, they can have prezygotic barriers where the pollen won't grow all the way down to fertilize the egg. Good. What else? Yeah. Um, this might be too dumbed down, but if they're in different locations, they would never see one another naturally. No, that, that's, that's good. No, is that pre or post? Pre. Yeah. So we're thinking about if most speciation is allopatric in different areas, right, well, it helps to be in different areas you can't mate anymore. Good. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so we have, you know, rather than hybrid just being sterile, we can have hybrid just doesn't work work well, right? Good, and that happens too. What else? 
Mm-hmm. Right, so you can have different places or different times. Um, so think about, you know, what were, were the first plants to bloom in the spring? If they have enough plant species that blooms, you know, a month later, they can't reproduce. So, good. What else? Mm-hmm. Right, so um, you know, some plants can do slightly a portion of their developing fruits, right? And so when it comes to like fig walking, they actually use that to help release the mutualism. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about that later. But you can also have them say, okay, this one's not growing right, let me stop giving that that into the people so it's growing properly. Good. <coughs> so here's a little bit of a canonical list of things, right? So as, as we said, you know, physical or temporal isolation, because they've got a barrier. Lack of proper mating cues, we'll get to what that might mean later. Um, mechanical problems, okay. community problems. And then post-agotic hybrid inviability, right? So the least one hybrid or hybrid sterility. Okay. <coughs> so for example, lions and tigers, right? They're very different things, right? Hunting, hunting prides, solitary hunters, right? Um, savanna, woodland, right? Very different things. But actually, they can interbreed, right? So you get ligers and pygons, depending on which, which, which species is the, is the maternal. Okay. Um, <coughs> but they don't do this in nature. Why? I think that zero offspring, yep, yeah, what, good. What else? Is there a higher cancer rate in them? I don't know. I mean, there, there could be. Is it, I mean, they have, so the biggest cats in the world now are these hybrids. Um, because I think there's this, this um, constant fight between male and female for, you know, they produce an offspring together, right? Well, for that female, she might produce additional offspring later, right? And so she doesn't want to give all her resources to that offspring because it should do, probably do better if she can save some resources for future offspring, right? For the male, he may not mate with this female again. And so it's his evolutionary advantage if she gives all the, all the things she can to his offspring and then some other guy's offspring in the future. But you have this tension between <coughs> maternal effect, saying she gives you know, as much as you can to his offspring, but it's maternal effect is trying to fight that. Okay? And so after here, um, some of the defense mechanisms of females have broken down, and so that leads to bigger offspring than the other ones have. Sometimes they don't co-occur. They don't occur in the same habitats. So even if they wanted to mate, they couldn't. Right? That's probably a behavioral thing. Okay, lack of proper mating cues. Right? So, <coughs> you imagine you're a bird, you're, you're looking for a mate, you see something to do this. Right? Maybe it's tremendously sexy to you. For most species, they'll probably just be scared to death. Right? And so, <coughs> you know, it's great, it's cool footage. Um, so if this is happening, right, most birds just fly away. Right? And actually this female flies away and now it's unlucky. Uh, it's not, not, not cool enough to dance dancing, right? And so you can imagine once you start evolving, you know, these sort of things, um, different species, different, you know, species might evolve to have different preferences, okay? And so then, even if being sexy, and other species really just don't think it's being weird. Right? So you have to think evolving with songs, with displays, with smells, and all these things can lead to um, <coughs> improper mating cues. Okay? Mechanical problems. Okay? <coughs> so here is a male beetle, a group of beetle, male and female. Okay? Big leg she has, all right? Looks like she can jump. It's actually iron for jumping, but for throwing them off. Okay, so you're going to throw them off. And here's his inverted penis and these spikes that scar the female. Okay. <coughs> um, and what happens is, well, I think he's scarring her, and so eventually the oviduct will form scar tissue and heal, and you'll be able to have no offspring. Right? So if she's going to have any, uh, any offspring, they have to be his. It's their last chance. And so again, it's that male-female conflict in mating. Um, 
which is then she's selected for devoting as much energy as she can into his offspring rather than some future mating offspring. Okay. Even though you know, it causes damage. Fruit flies do something similar with chemicals, and actually it can lead to, if you mate them with different species, if they don't have defense mechanisms, it can kill them. Right. So it's an interesting <coughs> male-female conflict here. Any questions about this? Okay, so a gametic problem. So the egg and sperm just not coming together well, right? So here we have, you know, um, two different species, okay? And I made them with members of their own species or members of different species. And we'll see how many offspring are um, created from that mating. What do you see? What the plot chart? Yeah. So I take this coroni population, right, and I make them with other coroni, and that's this, this is the set of points. And I also make them with something from the oral puche group, and vice versa here, right? So mating things from the same area, different area. Okay. And it's a pair, I think it's a pair of same individual, like the same individual in both cases, like the same female mating with different males, or the same male with different and so you can see, like, so it could just be that, you know, some of them can't reproduce well, and so they're always low in both. And so I do this pair of study. And so what do you see of this distribution of points? Yeah. Just like moving from the ones to the left hand side of the area. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's here off there. Right. You see most of these lines are pointing down. Right. So you make it to the same area, you kind of have more off there. Mm-hmm. Not always. Right. So this is a trend. An absolute rule. Okay, but it suggests something that's make, keeping them from slaughtering as many offspring. Okay. Hybrid inviability. Okay, so here we have these green toads in Sicily, the breeding, and they have various issues. Right, so monkey looking tadpoles, right, or dead tadpoles. Um, frogs that never develop, tadpoles never develop all the way. And, <coughs> you know, finally some manage to survive, right? And so it's not saying that they completely can't reproduce with each other, right? But those that do have many fewer surviving offspring than those that make with ones of their own species, right? What would this be the selection pressure this creates? Mm-hmm. All right, so you could have some way of, you know, if, if you will breed with any frog or any toad, then you on average have fewer offspring than if you can breed with one where you're perfectly compatible, right? And so it selects from some mechanisms that you can recognize same species, different species, right? And that could be call, that could be matching based on body size, that could be matching based on location. There's many ways to get that, right? This little same pressure. Okay? And if that happens after things have been separated and come back together, we call that reinforcement. This selection pressure for preventing interbreeding. Okay. Hybrid sterility. So here are mules. Right? Mules are awesome. They're smart, you know, they don't fall into the Grand Canyon, you have them walking up and down all the time, right? Um, but they're sterile. And <coughs> they're formed from a male donkey, right, which has 62 chromosomes, and a female horse on 64. Why might they, why might they be sterile? Why? Um, okay. Oh, all right. So, yeah. So you know this is okay, right? So there must be something here, right? Um, how so? You're right. But, uh, 
So this is the diploid chromosome number. So just make it easier to make it just three chromosomes, right? So now I have you know, some sort of you somehow pair these up, right? And that won't work properly. And so I'll get the wrong number of chromosomes in this eggs and sperm, and so then they're gonna try to you know combine this another bigger sperm that's not fertile. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly how meiosis work in this case, so you could possibly, you know, by chance, if you were just doing this randomly. Yeah. At some point, by chance, you might, right? Um, and <coughs> it depends on whether you, it could be that if they can't line up, they don't produce any sperm or egg stops. Um, but it raises another good point. I mean, so you know, he's talking about you know, as I say, it's, you know, biology always has these gray areas. It could be that sterility means you know, 0.001 percent chance of having an offspring. Uh, if you could if you could reproduce with another mule. Um, and they had the same, and the chromosomes line up, then yeah, I would fix the problem. So then, they're also, they're also going to be viable to right. other Right. Yeah, yeah. F2s, yeah. So they can be, you know, they'd both be 62 or 64 at that point. <laughs> yeah, but the bigger point is that, like, it's really so, you know, you could try it many, thousands of times and never see it occurring. Like, maybe there's a very, very low chance of it. Yeah. Well, you could probably like sort the egg and sperm and figure, find the ones that have the right number of chromosomes together. Or put, um, you can put meiosis drivers on them. It'll cause different chromosomes to have different problems being passed on and things like that. So there could be ways if you wanted to. Other questions? Okay. So Dobzhansky Muller incompatibilities. Okay. So <coughs> how does how does you know viability or sterility evolve? Right? Like think about how that selection works, right? Am I gonna have selection for a an allele that causes me to have an viable offspring? No. Right? It could drift to fixation, but it's a pretty high fitness cost for the drift to fixation. Right? So then how do I have these Right? How do I have you know some separation result in two species that can't reproduce anymore? Right? When throughout both their histories, they're always reproducing with everything else in their population. Okay, so what I want you to do is think about a scenario. Where I have what's the population? A A B B. And then they separate, and then some point later they come back and top. They come back and can get close to each other again, but then are inviable. Their offspring are inviable. So think about the original alleles as A and B B, and then think about new ones like A and A and B B. We have those above. So talk to talk to each other in groups to so figure it out. Derive this. Thank you. 
Yeah. Oh, so just imagine you, imagine you have some mutation that introduces the little a in the population. Right? So you go, you know, a, 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 b, b, and some individuals, and these you know, other individuals. Right? So let's give you, I'll give you one more minute. So who has the answer? Yeah. Uh, almost surely no. But, there's, but there is. Yeah. There, yeah. But do you have do you have a correct answer? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I mean it's not a fine. But there's a limited set of possible answers. Like a, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's imagine in this population, right, I have then a mixture of A, A, B, B, and at some point I get a little A mutation. A, A, B, B. Okay. Now, if this causes sterility, right, little A won't support and persist, right? So if the lay with everything else comes to really, it will die out. If it doesn't, I guess I'll, I think we'll eventually get to little lay, little lay, big B, big B. Right? Now if this happens, it doesn't cause sterility, yeah, it's fine. Right? <coughs> um, so I can have this population eventually get to here. Okay. I can do the opposite in this population. Okay. Now what? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we know that little a, little a can persist fine with big, 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 right? How about with little b, little b? We have no idea. It's never, it's never seen little b, little b at all. So it could be fine, little b, little b, or it could lead to lethality or sterility or something like that. So when they, when they, you know, reproduce and have a a e b offspring, yeah. Yeah. 
So probably for like, terms of like population overall size, yes. But remember, evolution happens within populations and it's based on like individual fitness, right? So <coughs> other than like species selection, something like that we should talk about later, which are minor in effect for this sort of thing, right? So f for in what you ask yourself is, for individuals, is it better for that individual to have inviable offspring or sterile offspring? Rather than for the population as a whole, the population, you know. So, for example, um, <coughs> there used to be an idea um, by Wynne Edwards et al. That, like sometimes one reason the animals chorus, and, like, ca like frogs call, is not in order to attract mates, but to do a census. Say, how many are we? One, two, three. Okay. Well, we, if we all mate, there'll be too many, too many tadpoles, and they'll, they'll starve. Okay. Larry, you mate this time. All right. Um, and that would be best for the population, right? You don't have things competing and starving and we see things. You know, if you have overproduced offspring, you have starvation. Everyone does badly. So it would be better if we could somehow randomly or if other thing, you know, cause things that, you know, some, some reproduce, some withhold reproduction, right? <coughs> but it doesn't work. So that's so the strategy of so cheaters, right? Because if someone says, if, you know, Larry, you reproduce, Fred still reproduces anyway, right? Good for Fred. Right? So everyone else is sort of withholding the reproduction or lowering it. Fred's still going at it, right? It has many, many offspring, right? So then that strategy persists in the population, right? So sort of an individual level selection is what rules in that scenario. And so with, with your question, <coughs> you know, it might be better for the population as a whole if that, if, you know, the, you, for the reasons you suggested, that, you know, inviability is better than sterility. You don't have these, you know, you know, sterile zombies walking around that just take up room. Right? If an individual being selected for you know, under, under selection, you know, those that produce sterile offspring, those that produce you know, dead offspring, there's probably not a big selection difference for that, for, that, for those individuals. Because then the selection wouldn't really work on that difference. Question? Yeah? Um, I'm curious about the fact that these sterile offspring as a mechanism to get from predators. So I would say you know, there's like two or four that could breed and the rest were sterile and they would surround the rest of them. They could, but the, so the ones that are in the center, it's great for them, right? But those that are surrounding them, you know, if there's some sort of mechanism that makes them sterile, if something evolves, you know, the ability to not be sterile in that case, then it would have more offspring than it would otherwise have. So that's the trait that I'm selected for. Um, this becomes, I mean, so basically just individual selection doesn't work. However, you know, when you have, you know, a group of things living together repeatedly and they have some relatedness and things like that, then it can get more complex, right? So, <coughs> worker bees, um, bees are haplodiploid, right? And so that means that ha if, if you don't mate your, or don't give sperm to your egg, you produce a haploid, it's a male, and then otherwise you produce a female. And so worker bees can still lay eggs. They don't mate, so they're male eggs, but they can still lay them. There's something called policing in hives where if I'm a worker, individual worker bee, I use my advantage to slip a few eggs in there and have you know, my direct descendants, but then other bee, other your sisters will go around and kill your eggs. So it's, because it's to their advantage to have the mother producing the offspring rather than their sister producing the offspring. And so there's that sort of selection pressure too. Um, now within a single organism, there's sometimes you know, advantageous to have some dead offspring. Right, so poison dart frogs, <coughs> really cool system where you know, they lay eggs in like a little bromeliad cup or something, right? We have like the male will bring a female there and lay the egg there and she'll fertilize it and she'll wander off. And now you have this little tadpole in a cup with almost nothing to eat. Right? So what happens is the male will periodically guide the female back and she'll lay another egg in there for the tadpole to eat, right? And so it's, you know, like, you know, here, eat, eat your sister. She's delicious, right? Um, <coughs> but it, for that female, she produces more offspring by sacrificing some to the other offspring than she would if she, you know, laid that egg in a different bromeliad and they both starve to death. So, this, you know, this, so for, her, for her fitness, you know, it's optimal to do that strategy. Um, sharks were actually in the, so some, not all sharks lay eggs, some lie for a thing. Some will actually have predation inside the womb. The first shark, I'm sure, will eat its siblings. Which, you know, for the other siblings, isn't so hot. But for the mother, 
we suggest you know that way if the first one is like malformed or something, then the second one will do better and kill its sibling, and then so she's guaranteed to have a nice strong pup come out. Everything's really cool. <coughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. Right, so it's like the British royal family, you have an heir and a spare, right? So you have the firstborn that, you know, gets the first choice of the, you know, and can outcompete its sibling for food and such. If they're, if they're doing, if the eagles are doing so well that there's enough food for both of them, then they raise both. But if there's only enough food for one of them, that firstborn one, first hatched one, survives better. So it's a competition there. Yeah. Yep. It's like cuckoos. Yeah. The cuckoos are also like. You see a cuckoo chick like will sort of scooch over and push the other eggs out of the nest. So they, they go to the nest or even that. But yeah, right. And you know, you've selected four in this preference stuff that the awesome is full of maybe the more open then you go to the next biggest chick or something. Yeah. Good. Other questions about this? That's cool. Um <coughs> so I can you know, tease your siblings. Um so the big thing here is that, you know, little A and little B have never encountered each other. Right? And so there's never been selection pressure on little a and little b getting along. Right? And so it could be that when little a and little b come together, now you don't produce enough of some, some compound. Right? And so you're inviolable. Um, and that wouldn't have happened in this case because we still have the big A, big A producing enough. Right? Or here we have the big B, big B producing enough. Maybe here we don't have enough of that compound. Or something else that causes some maybe interaction here. Okay? And so it's thought that, you know, one way, way species accumulate, you know, this incompatibility is by evolving these DMIs, these two more compatibilities. Right? Such that within this within this population, they can make fine, then we can connect together with some small chance they can lead to incompatibility. If you have enough of these, then you can have complete incompatibility and fertility. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Right. So we could have um, polypoidization. This happens a lot in plants, where <coughs> you know, I suddenly go from having you know, 16 chromosomes to having 32, right? And now I can't reproduce with any more 16, but I can reproduce with other 32s. Yep. And that's sort of a way to get instantaneous speciation, right? It requires you having, you know, rather than going down the haploid 8 and 8, you have, you have another genetic going in 16 and 16, right? So it has to happen at the same time. You could have a single plant or something like that. You know, it does happen in the this. In some plant groups, it's known that that happens frequently. Yeah? So, so this, um, these incompatible alleles, we call them the genetic incompatibilities. And so how they arise is we have this theory of how they can appear. But you know, this this mechanism for lack of fertility or viability is known as the genetic molecular compatibility. Right. Yep. Other questions about this? Yeah. Oh, so if you wait long enough, perhaps not, right? So if, if some of them do have the big A, then sure, you could then select for those. And, but if, if it's, you know, if it's gone long enough, but there's, not, there's no longer any big A's, right? Which, if, it, if little A is drifting, it might take a long time. If little A is being selected for some reason, it can happen faster. Yeah. And again, this is a sort of stats game, right? So even if there are some big A's, Right? If they repeat, so they have, you know, if it's 90% this and 10% this, right? 
Well, on average, the things between here and here are this with some weight and this with some weight. These might be fine, and these might be poorly. And so on average, you do better mating in your population than between populations. Right? So it still result in you know, reduced fertility and, or viability, but not as reduced as you're going to one more this. Make sense? Other questions about this? Okay. So speciation, we, have, we talked about this earlier, right? Allopatric, parapatric, sympatric. We often simplify this and just think about, you know, the binary choice of allopatric and sympatric. Okay. Um, and you think about, you know, what might lead to allopatric and sympatric speciation? So, knowing what we know about these, right, which is more likely to happen with allopatric? If I, ha if I have allopatric speciation or I have sympatric speciation, which mechanism do you play in the role? Oh, speciation. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Well, it could be, right? So if you have like a mountain range or separate mountain, that's definitely that's clearly allopatric. Um, but, you know, if, if you make different fruits in the same environment, you would still call that sympatric. Even though they're different locations or different time. I, I made it at night, you made it during the day. Right? That's temporal, same location, but yeah, so, I, so they could play a role there. Yeah. What else? It must have seemed to be easier for them to evolve in allopatric. Right? It's hard to think of something where it would be easier to evolve in sympatric. Right? So it's, you know, that covered mating cues, you know, everyone else is singing and I'm doing on a log. Right? Then, <coughs> then I'm just going to have mates. Right? Um, whereas if, you know, in the small population off the side, everyone starts being on logs and you can't hear singing because there's a waterfall or something. Right? And, you know, you know, as all the people know, you can't get them at all. Um, <laughs> you have a problem, same idea. Where you can imagine, you know, traits where, you know, in this population, you know, males evolve a spike and females evolve a stronger wall, and males evolve a bigger spike and a stronger wall, and here, that's are using the toxic chemical, and they're using the antidote, and toxic antidote, right? And then when they come back together, you have, you know, these females are not immune to this chemical, these females are not resistant to that spike, and so they both do that badly. Right. We're just recalling that in sympathy would be hard. Okay. Um, okay. Let's get this, let's get this one. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, and so one thing people have done is try to look for some speciation because we know how the speciation happens. There's tons of evidence for it. Um, and the question is, can sympatric species happen at all? Okay. Why, why, why might people care about that? So the allopatric, everything had to, everything you see occurring in one place had to have been separated at some point. For sympatry, you know, they could have evolved in situ. Right? So if I'm on Hawaiian Islands, right, do I think that, you know, or they'll take GSPs of, you know, got to go up with those finches, down those finches. Right? So the small group of islands, do I think that they do have multiple species on one island that they, you know, land there in species, or do they have multiple invasions of this island in species? Sort of question. Um, <coughs> also, we'll think about. Oh yeah. Um, so, 
Mm-hmm. Um, is only like location differences. Location. Yeah. Where where you know when you're cruising for a mate, you can't see anything from the other population. Oh. Yeah. So if you if you know, so a lot of insects only mate on their host planet, right? Um, so if I could fly over to the neighboring host plant and mate, then it's still sympatric. And so there are lots of cases where we have specialists that are related in a similar area. And so <coughs> some kids might think that maybe it's a somatic appreciation scenario. Right? Or a small air island has more more aggressive maybe some appreciation. Right? Um, a lot of cases we think you know, it'd be swell if you could speciate. Right? If I have a resource you know where my distribution I have some small seeds and some big seeds, right? And my population, you know, if I start evolving small big ones and big big ones, then when I, you know, have them reproduce, we get this you know, general average distribution again, right? Because you know, by chance I mate with a small well, big one, I'm a big big one, and maybe a medium big one, right? We have this lack, we have this, you know, lack of sort of mating leading to this mixture, right? We say, oh, it'd be so great if they could just, you know, speciate. And then, you know, you have two populations, and this one could evolve to match this, this one could evolve to match this. And they have more birds in general that do better, that better fit their environment. Why can't evolution just do that? Right? And for cases like that, people start wondering, well, could sympathetic speciation work in this case? Okay. And so, <coughs> we'll talk about some of the mechanisms we have people develop to try to make, make those models work. Okay. And here, to go back, and these are just thought of as a classic example of this. Because you have these a few lakes in Canada, right, where <coughs> you have two stickleback species or populations, and some are looking for living um, near the bottom, and they go around like come to a the bottom, and some are like breeding males, right? right? They use their gills to filter feed from the water. They have big gill rakers to help filter them out. Okay, and so you have <coughs> these two populations in this fairly small lake. So think, okay, and we know that they were derived from marine stickleback. Okay, so see those rows, they got trapped in this lake, see so they went down, they're stuck there, and now we have two populations there. for many years. And now I think what it was was sort of competition instead. So rather than having one invasion, it's only two invasions. So first you have you know, um, one one the ocean going down to the lake, okay? It starts evolving with the genotypes, right? Stuff in the plankton, but also the stuff in the bottom. And then later, a separate one appears, right? There's now that can be consistent with the green form, right? And then it can displace logically what's already there. As long as they don't interbreed, you can result in separation, right? They interbreed a lot, then they just disappear. We think about mechanisms of pods on that. That's basically what we get now. It's not some speciation. It looks like, looks like it only, it's actually um, re reintroduced, re reintroduced. Re okay. uh, yeah? Isolation, when they come back together, though that population has a slightly bigger beak. Does better if it's even bigger still, and the other one has a slightly smaller beak. It's better to have a slightly smaller beak still. And they push hard that way, but already they're not interbreeding. Yeah, that's the idea. And of course, it's a little more complex than that. There is some interbreeding still going on and things like that. And so the question is, how much interbreeding can you have and still maintain that distinctiveness? Right. And so one thing you can you, be perfectly fertile, for example, but if there's no seed tree to your intermediate size, then you're still dot. You still have your offspring. Okay, that makes sense? Okay. And so here's the models we'll have. <coughs> you know, so Sergey Gavrilis, who's in the department here, one of his research topics is to create models like this and say, okay, here I have some heterogeneous resource squares, and now I will have population. Can population evolve to 
use different resources and not integrate anymore? Or will you know, integrating how you think these changes disappear? Right? So creating models like this in test. Okay. What's the point of that? So I create, create a computer game in my computer game and you get different colored circles. And sort of in life. That's what's the point of doing something like this. Right, so I'm saying here's a, model, here's a simple model of some metric speciation, and I can run the parameters and show, yes, it could work. Okay, I can say, yeah, well, fine, a little computer game, very simple, it works. Sometimes me, I, I say biology. What, what, so what's, what's the relevance of it to this? So you show it can work, okay, then what? You're right, you're getting there. So you can't care the maintenance of some diversity, how much diversity you can bring in to help with inbreeding without causing it to you know, merge into species and like that. Right. So make predictions they can use for doing conservation. Good, what else? So that's a model where I can say, okay, I could report at least four species and I have um, areas. Let's see if that, let's, let's use it to estimate species diversity for time. Good. What else? So one person models is to make predictions between them test. Right? So we can say, okay, if this is happening, then I know that it works better if my areas are clumped rather than being fully mixed together. So I predict that you see things that look similar to species and be clumped in nature. So, as, so, if we so if we encode our current thinking in the model, we can say, okay, the model then says this, let's see if our current thinking is correct. And we go out and test it in nature. Right, so that's one purpose of the model, so we go out and test these predictions in nature. See if they're right. right. Same way we would do hardy weinberg equilibrium. Right? Why would we teach you that? Well, it's easy to take tests on, right? It's really you know, good matrix, and that's fine. But what it's really for is a null model, right? So we say, okay, here, something else is happening, here's what happens, right? Maybe we find some deviation from that, we've learned something. Oh, wow, opportunities are finite. Oh, wow, you're, you know, you're sort, of, sort of being made in. Oh, wow, the selection happened. Right, so we can test this, even this is a model to test it. Right, any questions? Yeah. Right, so you get, you get this, you get the fuzziness. Yeah. We're like, yeah, if we, if we exclude that parapatric region, like, yes, it's very clearly distinct, but actually it's a gradation. Right, so that's why it can be interesting. So, how much clumping you need to have if you have expectations that are not enough to have? You know, if you have just one migrant per generation, that enough to push the pulling back together, you'd have 20 per generation. So. And so, with modeling, you can say actually the threshold is actually about one migrant per generation. So, you have more than that. Tends to pull them together and selection pressure. If you have fewer than that, it's still diverge. Good. Um, there's a couple other slides we can deal with them later. All right. Okay, I'll see you on Monday.